So, uh, good evening, good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope you're fine. Uh, we are starting now um, our uh, fifth uh, meeting of, of search engine and knowledge discovery engine team. And uh, we, had, uh, we have uh, actually now something like three main points. Two of them uh, we started uh, to discuss yesterday. Uh, let's uh, let's recall the uh, ranking criteria and um, entities relation extraction and knowledge graphs. There are two main points that uh, at the end of the uh, yesterday's uh, talk uh, started to to be discussed. So I, I would like uh, us to to, to keep uh, further uh, talking about it, and uh, I. I would um, have um, let's say a um, next uh, topic proposal, namely a role task assignment. Since uh, already uh, there were the, that popped up somewhere in in our Slack thread that uh, people starting are starting to ask uh, for uh, their roles or, or some assignments. So I think it would be uh, it, it's already the highest time to. Uh, to 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 sh let's say to uh, divide our like to start uh, employing things and uh, to do that to divide uh, tasks. So maybe a ranking criteria would like to start uh, on on that. No one? <laughs> Come on, yesterday uh, had everyone uh, full and this what you're asking. Yeah, sure. I, I, I miss what you're asking, Lucas. Uh, yeah, just uh, I wanted to talk about uh, ra ranking criteria. Um, because yesterday uh, we, we had a heated discussion about it. And now, actually, no one seems to be interested in anymore. So, uh, ah, okay, okay, I've got it. I, I've joined somewhere in the middle, and uh, I didn't get actually <laughs> before what, what you were saying. What what I've discovered personally yesterday after I watched this video with AI2, uh, actually, they delivered a complete mess, to be honest. And uh, criteria they used just keywords, and these keywords like full text search. In, it's unacceptable. So basically, uh, all training models they are trained on, on wrong data, wrong assumptions, and uh, we have to go back now and we have to create kind of uh, clean collections uh, with only uh, COVID-19 related, related papers. And uh, I think we will get like probably 800 or 1,000 publications. And uh, we have to ask people actually to review every publication if it's really uh, related to COVID or it's related to COVID with, uh, I don't know, cats and dogs. So uh, <laughs> this is how we will create really a good training set. And uh, in current situation, it makes no sense actually to do all this ranking. Okay, yeah, that's, I think to some extent it's, it's a valid point. If it's mess, so John, maybe you won't jump upon it. Sure. Um, so yeah, I think uh, it is the case that you know uh, any sort of search ranking um, related thing is going to be very difficult to get right, um, and part of the reasons for that include you know things like Slava mentioned around a lot of the COVID nineteen papers not actually being about coronavirus. You know, they're about uh, MERS or SARS, um, previous viruses, um, and so uh, in order to do good search ranking, we need to have more structured data. Um, maybe it's not the case that we need to get rid of all of these papers, but just make sure that they, you know, are weighted low in the search ranking. Um, you know, I think there probably are people who are interested in, for example, the. Uh, COVID-19 in dogs or ferrets. Um, those things are very useful for clinical researchers, um, things like that. 
Um, but uh, yeah, uh, I think, you know, the discussion yesterday was around uh, using things like uh, journal importance and things like that as a uh, portion of this ranking. And I think that those are still true. Um, basically, my suggestion is that we come up with as, as many different ways of uh, getting some sort of structure to the data set as we can uh, so that we can recombine those and reweight those in ways that seem to give good results. Okay, so um, regarding like st structuring the uh, initial data, um, are you talking about kind of like separating them into, for example, things that talk about strictly coronavirus or COVID-19 or SARS and MERS? No, no, no. Uh, what actually I meant, uh, so first of all, we need to, to split on collections. And one collection can be uh, maximum, I think, 100 documents which is visible, feasible for a human to review, more or less. So if you'll get like 800 papers and uh, it will be eight collections, so we will get like eight people to review those papers. And after a manual review, uh, we'll get, I don't know, probably 200 papers rela related to COVID-19, 100%. And after we, we can do analysis, so basically to run pipeline, to extract all relations and uh, all entities. And we're going to, uh, to get a training set that can be used actually for, uh, for more precise uh, evaluation of what we already have. Is it clear? Yeah. Yeah, uh, um, yeah go ahead, go John, ahead. sorry. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I, I would say yes, uh, we do need to construct some sort of training set um, and I think that you know there are several different facets to that. One is you know just making sure that the papers are relevant in the first place, um, but I think that we want to go further than that and actually you know have these annotators pull out what they think is the useful structured information that we should be getting from each one of these papers. Um, and so I know that uh, Maya, for example, has been working on trying to figure out what those types of uh, things that uh, researchers who are working on risk factors would want to get from risk, risk factor related papers. We've talked about some of those things as like, you know, what is the study type? What are the actual results? What are the confidence intervals, et cetera? Um, but uh, as we can create that training set, we want to, we should make sure that uh, it's quite thorough, not just in, in terms of selecting the papers, but also in terms of what information we actually have about those papers as like targets that we can hit in terms of trying to extract that information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, from artificial intelligence point of view, we'll use uh, supervised uh, machine learning instead of un unsupervised. Uh, Good point. Sorry, this is Rose Glavin, and I, I think you need to be more specific with the use case. Because, oh, Jeremy, you're here. Hi. I was just going to reference the difference between what you're looking for and what I'm looking for. And so sure. eliminating, for example, all of the, the MERS and SARS, I think you actually are interested in those, right? Correct. Yeah. So, so, so whoever is doing the labeling has to know, has to know the use case, right? I don't think you're going to be able to pull together papers that work for everybody. Okay, so what you're saying, we need to actually apply clustering first. That's so one way to approach it, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we need to cluster all uh, papers in, in, into categories. And uh, so, well, we can run uh, actually this small experiment to get all COVID-19 uh, specific papers. And after we can repeat for um, other topics, why not? If it will be successful experiment. Um, Slava, so yeah. regarding the, and I think, Rose, maybe I'm misunderstanding what you're saying, but I think like if we say that we only want papers that are related to COVID-19, we're actually missing out on the opportunity because I like, I'm no uh, biomedical expert, but like um, COVID-19 is part of a family of coronaviruses, right? So like if we were to only uh, narrow it down to just COVID-19, then we're missing out on potential leagues on from other viruses. 
I don't yes, think we'll, I think it depends I don't think on the we'll, use case. I don't think yeah, we'll exactly. miss something big because uh, actually in papers uh, related to COVID-19, action should mention. So if we apply uh, name entity recognition to those papers, we should actually find uh, all uh, related families also. Yeah, um, just to short circuit things a little bit. Uh, I don't think that Slav is actually proposing that we discard those from our data set. No. Um, he's just proposing that, you know, uh, we create several different uh, potential uh, candidates for uh, like a uh, training set based on a bunch of different criteria. And one of those criteria oh, okay. would be researchers who are just interested in you know, just the coronavirus, um, you know, SARS-CoV-2 related literature. Um, yeah, so, so just, uh, just to say over here. Right, instead of cooking a soup, we want to have our ingredients all in different categories. So after we got those separate ingredients, now we can combine them and cook something interesting. But right now we definitely need some really nice data set for just pure COVID-19 stuff, for MERS, for like all of this, you know, whatever categories we will, you know, face. And for example, like right now, right, we have Jeremy, Rosa, Showing up to the table and you're like, hey guys, can we, you know, build this for not only COVID-19 stuff, but actually there is a pool of much more knowledge. And we're kind of like, oh, wait a second. Yeah, but we already have our pipeline tweaked on a clean separate ingredients, right? And now we just simply, oh, wait a second. This is just like broccoli. We already have, you know, some cauliflower trained system. Let's just throw it in and boom we get result immediately versus we're trying to cap what type of features is for this, for that, like it's both greens and meats and like it, it becomes messy. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I, I really believe that we need to uh, make, uh, make all this noise as less as possible in, for all topics. Okay. Um, also just related on this topic, I'll add a little plug that, um, there's, our, there's a team that's doing um, uh, classification by study design. Um, and I think regarding annotations, we don't have that many annotators in terms of capacity. Um, Maya is using them quite a bit, but we're, I think uh, if Isaac's here, um, for the creating that uh, little knowledge graph, um, for relation extraction, he also is requesting a need for annotations. So we'd have to prioritize what exactly would we annotate first. Um, so a couple things here. Uh, Alexei brought up the idea of uh, using snorkel, which I think is a good idea. Um, mm -hmm. In order to use snorkel properly, we're probably going to need to do some better pre-processing and figure out, you know, uh, what papers might be uh, might this generalize to, um, so that we can you know, have small sets of papers that are annotated well and then generalize those to other sets. Uh, so using a, a semi-supervised or weak supervision approach. Um, uh, second would be that I'm actually working a bit on finding some more annotators right now. Um, so I just had a call with uh, the other community that I'm part of, uh, uh, Open COVID-19, which has a lot more science people in it um, and tried to uh, call for some of the people who are, you know, researching COVID-19 right now to potentially collaborate at least on uh, giving us the type of information that they would want to pull from a given paper um, or potentially going so far as to actually help us with annotation. Um, so hopefully we can get some more people doing that, but uh, we definitely need to be cognizant of the limited annotation resources that we do have. Um, and I think you know, anybody who has some background um, in biomedical sciences, uh, it could be potentially useful. You know, they could do a initial round of annotation that then someone who's more expert could go in and validate it without spending as much time, um, things like that. So uh, we, we should spend some more time thinking about what annotation looks like, but uh, there are also things that are like pretty obvious in terms of, uh, you know, annotation, like, can we actually pull out confidence intervals properly? Like someone without 
any biosciences background can can get things like that from the paper. Um, so we should definitely spend some more time figuring out exactly what the different pieces of knowledge that we want to pull out are and how uh, qualified each annotator needs to be in order to actually get that information. Okay. Yeah. And um, regarding snorkel, yeah, I think I saw that post um, a while ago as well. Yeah. Um, we're definitely trying to incorporate that. Jeremy, do you want to uh, explain a little bit more about Causally and whatnot? I think it would be good to get everybody on the, you know, on the loop on that. Yeah. So, so, um, so while we're talking about training sets, I, I keep thinking, well, there's a lot of people who've already extracted a lot of really ca useful causal assertions from the literature and related it back to the literature. So it's not just uh, orphaned from it, but it has the provenance as well, right? And um, so one of those uh, one of those groups is, is causally, which we actually here at uh, Corona Y have free access to. Um, uh, I can give you guys the registration link if you're interested in checking it out. Uh, they have also, I just received an email from Causally this morning, and they basically said that uh, Causally has now machine read all 40,000 papers from the CORD-19 and identified a network of a million plus causal effect interactions. Uh, from the thousand possible substance relevance, coronaviruses we'll be discussing this morning on our webinar next week. So uh, if you want to check that out, you can, you can, uh, we can do that. We, and, I, and I can also be happy to give uh, folks a demo of, of Causally at some point. Um, the other uh, resource that I just got into last night uh, is uh, indra.bio, and I'm just going to go ahead and put that in there. Uh, and this is a, a really remarkable resource. First of all, all the code is open source, unlike Causally. And they have also extracted uh, millions of, of causal assertions from the literature uh, from the CORD-19 data set. And uh, that is available at, let me go ahead and give you guys the link for that. I'll put all this in the Slack as well. Um, and so yeah, but definitely check out indra.bio. Uh, and um, they also utilize a number of uh, rule-based uh, literature extract, uh, you know, scientific knowledge extraction um, tools. Uh, one of them is called Reach, another one's called uh, uh, Sparser. Uh, and there's, they have a whole, uh, if you actually check out their, their website, they actually have a whole uh, list of, let's see if I can pull it up here. And, and can, I, can I share my screen? Would that be all right? Sure. Mm -hmm. All right. So if we go to, in, of course, I uh, killed all my uh, tabs last night, uh, but here we go. So, um, yeah, knowledge sources. So... There's a bunch of uh, general purpose causal relation reading systems, uh, IDOS, TRIPS, uh, Hume, SOFIA. And then uh, there's a whole bunch of biology oriented reading systems, um, DRUM, Sparser. I've been, I've been uh, so this is, uh, this is in Scala, or, uh, so I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. This is in the list, which I'm quite comfortable with. Actually, this one's the one that's in Scala. I don't know about the TRIPS one. It looks like that's actually LISP output. Um, uh, gene waves, so they have, and they have all these uh, these readers, and then in addition, they have uh, uh, they have uh, in the ability to ingest all these different um, exchange databases, pathway databases, and then they have these custom knowledge bases. Hypothesis is a very interesting one because uh, basically anyone can annotate any anything on the web, and it will just suck in all those causal assertions. Uh, and, uh, and so you, if you really want to have like a large crowdsourced um, annotation group, then Pypothesis allows that to happen uh, uh, very easily. And uh, you can just focus on just the COVID-19 assertions that people are, are basically highlighting and annotating. Um, what all this does is really impressive because it takes these word models that it's extracting from the literature and actually converts them into uh, actual um, uh, computable like models. And let's see if I can show you an example of that. Um, actually, I think I have one up here. So, Indra's statement. So here we go. So we have SARS-CoV-2 uses angiotensin converting enzyme, right? Actually, let me uh, see if I can back out there. No. Uh, so actually that didn't, that one didn't work. Um, see if I can uh, pull up this. 
could be started importing Android's modules under statement. So, no, sorry. Uh, reading a sentence with trips. Here we go. So if you you just go uh, map uh, map two K one phosphorylates map K three at uh, at at this at three nine two o two and tyrosine two o four and it takes that processes it and then generates these models from it which you're not seeing here. So let's see if I can actually show you an example. Here we go. So. Here we go. Raf binds Vermu Fenab, uh, Vemura Fenib, Raf phosphorylates MEC and MEC phosphorylates ERK. And it does take a little while because it's actually going out to a server, a trip server to do that. Um, but then what it actually generates is it says, oh, Raf is a, uh, so the, the, the statements are Raf is a, is a complex. Uh, with Veramat, so right, right, Raf bind, uh, binds Veramufenib, so that creates a complex here, and it says Raf phosphorylates MEC, and that's that's there, and MEC phosphorylates ERK, and there you have this phosphorylation MEC ERK here, and from there, so it looks like that completed. So then, if I go uh, TP dot statements, boom, there's the statements. Then it assembles them into a model. And so this is a one-step model, so it's not including the explicit Michaelis-Menten uh, kinetics. Uh, so it's, now it's got a model. And so now there are four monomers. There's uh, RAF uh, bound to a verum, uh, which can optionally bind to uh, Vemurufenib, and then uh, Vemurufenib binding to uh, MAP, or it can, uh, it can optionally bind to MAPK3. And uh, then MEC, which can be uh, in two states, phosphorylated, unphosphorylated, or phosphorylated. And it's, all, it's automatically just generated this. And then it generates a bunch of rules. So it knows that uh, the, the, the RAF Vermufibine binding rule says that if you have RAF where it's not bound to Vermufunib and Vermufun, which is not bound to MAPK3, then you can get uh, RAF Verifuminib bound. And Ver so they, they both know that they're bound to each other. And there's a binding constant here. You could, that could be potentially a learn, learnable parameter. And then likewise, you have raf um dissociation. You have uh, RAF phosphorylation with MEC. And you have MEC phosphorylation with ERK. And each of those is basically represented as a rule that can be uh, automatically generated. And so you can, uh, so that's one level of representation of the model. Here's a deeper one. So this is actually just a representation of the reaction network that's described where RAF and uh, is not bound to veramufenib, neither is veramufenib bound to, I guess, MAP3K. And, and now after that, they are both bound to each other. Um, you have this case where MEC is unphosphorylated, and then after it binds to, uh, after it interacts with MEC, then it becomes, and I guess ERK, it, uh, ERK becomes phosphorylated, right? So, then you can do this even in two steps. You can actually generate a different model. This is a two-step model. And the idea here now is it's actually taking into account the Kalis uh kinetics. And so now all of this has been just derived from those original statements. So here's, a, here's the rules associated with this. Now you have uh, you know, this kind of bound state. Let's see, let's see if I can show you. So you have uh, raft binding to Veramufenib has this so I'm not sure what this is yet. But the, I guess the point is, is that you can generate like different levels of resolution of models from the same, uh, from the same uh, causal statements that you've extracted from the literature. Okay, so, Jeremy, yeah. it's, it's great. I mean, like, it's, it's amazing, but we are slowly running out of time. And, Got it. Uh, yeah, uh, but I would uh, warmly encourage you to join us uh, tomorrow because we need to have a discussion uh, on that further. Yep. Um, and also you, Rose, if you like, or I, I would like you to, to be with us tomorrow because actually you, you, you just started uh, to, to present uh, your point and uh, now it's uh, almost impossible to, yeah, to, to somehow to conclude this. 
So mm -hmm. my proposal is because theoretically we should have today something like three points on our agenda. We are actually in a half of the first point. So uh, yeah, I think that we can keep uh, uh, talking about it uh, tomorrow. That's uh, I think that's and in terms of uh, role and, and tasks uh, assignment. Uh, 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 Jeremy, could you could you stop sharing your uh, uh, yeah no problem screen? Perfect, thanks. Uh, in terms of uh, role and tasks assignment, uh, I think we we can uh, talk about it slowly now we can start uh, thinking about it but uh, first we need uh, we need to discuss uh, thoroughly uh, things that we are going to do that's there is pointless to start writing some coding some notebooks when we don't know precisely in which direction we are going and with which tools and which parts uh, of our work must uh, respond to efforts of other teams because otherwise it will be the same thing that in the first submission uh, period that uh, we had a couple of teams working almost on very similar things, but separately. And we want to, um, to do it differently. So there are some very quick questions. No, okay. So uh, I would say that, uh, thank you. Uh, mostly uh, thanks to, to Rose and Jeremy and Alex Longfer for being with us today. Uh, uh, you're welcome warmly uh, tomorrow at the same time, uh, 10 uh, past, uh, 10.30 Pacific time. Luke, uh, check the chat really quick. Sorry, yeah. Uh, what uh, would... Just... Uh, if we can, like, just have a second session um, on the same call with the people here and talk about it after we get through the agenda. Okay, so you, you want to stay, or? Yeah, we, I just, I think we're all interested in uh, seeing what Jeremy and Rose uh, have to show. Okay, cool. So I stop the recording, and uh, we can keep uh, like uh, talking with Jeremy. Okay, that's that's the point. Actually, yeah. I have to run off. I have to run to another meeting right now. I apologize. Okay, so okay, so okay. let's let's do it tomorrow. Let's do it tomorrow. We can we have also Slack at our disposal, so we can uh, talk on Slack and uh, also Trello uh, if uh, somebody has some drafts already to share. Uh, Anton, you want to? Uh, you uh, sorry, yes, uh, Imran. Yeah, sorry. I'm gonna sound like a broken record here, but I gotta say again, guys, please add. Um, add into the uh, diagram, the schematic, and add what's in the Excel sheet, what you want to do or slash working on. So we just at least have an idea of what direction we're going. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, a, good yeah, that's yeah. a good one. Yeah, uh, Anton, you wanted to, uh, to say something as well. I, I wanted just wanted to chime in that I need to jump on the next call. Sure. So if any follow-up session is there, please record it so okay. we could catch up on it. Because okay. like, like- Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Too many things going on, it's really hard to keep. So, record everything, guys. If you have any okay. external meetings, etc. Uh, yeah, I mean, like 100% agree. Uh, okay. But actually, okay, thanks. Uh, okay, but because Jeremy must also uh, go out, so we are finishing this session uh, and we see us tomorrow, the same time, in place. All right. Thank, Thank you, you very much and have a good day or night. <laughs> Take care, guys. Bye. Bye, guys.